and welcome to episode 99 of the Employee to Boss podcast. I am your host, Haley Hayhurst, the owner of Espresso Podcast Production, a full-service podcast agency specializing in editing, marketing, and strategy. And today, I have a really fun episode for you. But before we get into that, next week is episode 100, and I am absolutely thrilled. So be sure you come back next week for another exciting celebration episode. Reaching 100 episodes has been a goal of mine for since I started. So be sure you come back. That means I've had nearly 100 conversations with incredible entrepreneurs. So There's lots and lots of content for you to go through if you're just finding this podcast or if you're a weekly listener. I so, so appreciate you coming back every week to listen to my conversations with entrepreneurs about their journey from being an employee to becoming a boss. And I hope that all of these episodes have been very empowering for you. And I hope that you take those action steps at the end of each episode to really put that into place and move forward with your business. I would love to hear your thoughts, but more on that next week. So today, my guest is Pamela Dale. She is a trailblazer in women's financial empowerment. Her guiding belief is great things happen when women have money. Pamela mentors women in building sustainable monthly recurring revenue streams, and her expertise and passion lie in unlocking the potential for women to achieve economic independence and thrive in the world. Pamela has such a cool story that I cannot wait for you to listen to. She's been through so much in her life and has done various different entrepreneur journeys, but What she's doing now is really, really cool. It's something that I am very interested in learning more about and white labeling different services and selling them is definitely a lucrative business. So Pamela is the expert in that. All of her links are in the show notes. In this episode, we really talk about finding your genius, giving things away for free to build your authority and also your knowledge and I always think that, you know, everyone says, don't give everything away for free. And to a point that is true. But at the end of the day, if you give everything away for free, that still doesn't mean people are going to do it. They still need you. So I love her mindset on that. And we also talk about, as I mentioned, empowering women to have more money and do more with their lives. And this episode is just so, so good. If you are a listener on Spotify, I want to let you know that all of my videos from now on are going to be, or all of my episodes from now on are going to be video on there. You can still listen as you normally would with audio only, but if you would like to watch along, the videos will be streaming live on Spotify from now on. If you have any thoughts or feedback on that, please let me know. But for the time being, that is going to be how it goes. I think it only increases the experience because it doesn't stop you from just listening, but it gives you the option to see our facial expressions, all of that. And for anyone who listens on Apple but wants to start watching the video but doesn't have access to Spotify, I post every single video on YouTube. So be sure you go check that out. For any podcast nerds out there like me, this is a video that I recorded on Squadcast, actually. So typically, I will do Zoom interviews, but this one is Squadcast. If you've been thinking about using that platform, I have a code for you to use. So message me. It's linked with Descript. So, so far, I like it. The editing was pretty straightforward. I've done it before for my clients, but... If you are interested in using something other than Zoom, come connect with me on Instagram. It's Espresso Podcast Production, and I can give you my true thoughts on it. So I think that is all the housekeeping for today, and let's get right into this episode with Pamela Dale. Hi, Pamela. Thank you so much for joining me on the Employee to Boss podcast today. I am so excited to have this conversation with you. Haley, such an honor, and to be here with you Thank you. Yeah, so we connected a little bit ago, and I was actually just on your podcast, and 
you told me that you have this incredible story about how you came to do what you do, really from employee to boss. And so I'm really excited for you to share that with the audience today. If you wanted to start off by just telling us pretty much about that journey, but also what you do now, I would love for you to share. Well, there's no way I could have looking at who I am now back then and been able to tell you this is who I am and where I'd be. So what I would like to do Mm -hmm. first is what are the possibilities? I don't think in our wildest dreams, we can even get close. And if you could lean on that as we go through this story, that if it's possible for one person, it's possible for anyone, I think. And that's the first thought I think we need to have. But I didn't have that when I started. I just had sheer desperation to not go back to a job. So I was selling furniture. I was really good at selling because I was pregnant at 17 and didn't pass high school, didn't go back to university, just finished high school and decided that at that time I would raise my child and didn't go back to school. I did go back at 40, but I knew I needed to make more money than what minimum wage was going to give me. And I knew I wanted to make more money than that. So sales was a natural thing for me. And I learned how to communicate and sell. And I was selling furniture. And it's so interesting how these opportunities come in our lives. And we'll say no. Or we'll say things like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would that like, And that's exactly what happened to me when someone approached me in a martial arts studio when I was selling furniture next door and said, would you be interested in teaching English in Korea? And I said, what? Where's Korea? I had to look it up on the map, right? I'm a small town farm girl from the corner of Saskatchewan, Canada, and I was not worldly. I didn't understand. And I didn't have any formal education teaching English. So I actually said no. And that was probably the last time I ever said no. I was approached again later by the same people asking me to consider it. And do you know what my question was? How much am I going to make? Like it had to make sense to me on some level to even consider such absurdity to me. And I said yes. He said it would be 40 some dollars an hour, I think like $45 an hour US. And I was like, I'm Canadian, like that's big money. I'd never made that kind of money before. And this was in 2001. And it's like, okay, what does this look like? And it was a ride. And I will share that story at another date and time if you'd like. But I came back to Canada and I was different. And I thought, what if I could continue what I started by working semi kind of on my own. I built a school and taught private and built a private school over in Korea. And that got me thinking, well, what could I possibly do? What am I good at? And I was one of those people that didn't believe I had anything that was unique or different about myself because I was so self I know myself. I am myself. I live, breathe myself. So I couldn't see my own genius. And the journey was start teaching English online, and it was $25 an hour is what the people would pay in Vancouver, Canada at that time. And I loved it. And I had another job. I went back to corporate, but I'm like, I got to be able to move past this. So I was teaching and teaching. And then somebody had mentioned something about networking meetings. And I'm like, networking meetings, what are those? Right? Like, I don't know. So I started going to networking meetings and I heard people stand up and explain their businesses. And I was like, that's so exciting. How do you do that? I don't understand that. And I got excited. So I thought the only thing I'm good at, and I want you to hear through me what maybe is going on in your head, like you may be the only thing you can do, It's not true, but at that time it was the only thing I really enjoy is talking to people. So we started the $20 lunch project. Back then I could take someone out for lunch for $20 and I wanted them to tell me about their story, about their life. Who are you? Why do you do what you do? And then I got really courageous and started standing up in networking meetings and saying, hey, who's got a story of success but really shouldn't be? And people would laugh and I got over that embarrassment 
And over time, I realized the people I was most attracted to were coaches because they had a story of overcoming. And I came from a tough place. There was trauma, it was abuse. And I really didn't, through that, understand all of the blocks that I had around that, right? And what that was. But I knew that I was attracted to people who had overcome. So I thought, well, let's be a coach. Let's be a coach. It's easy being a coach, right? And it actually was for me. It became incredibly easy for me. But where I got hung up was in the client game. I, for the life of me, could not get a client. Like I couldn't. I was so filled with, I can't sell. I was a salesperson by trade. I couldn't sell myself. I couldn't figure this out. I was too scared to talk to people. So I took more coaching programs. I thought that would be the answer. So I'm a highly certified coach, <laughs> but I was broke. And it just kept perpetuating itself over and over and over and over again, which is what will happen until one day there needs to be a commitment to go one way or the other. And that's to quit because I was out of money or the thought of going and getting a job was enough to make me want to hurl. I couldn't, I thought somebody's gonna get hurt. I can't deal with the nonsense. Like you start to become more self-aware. And then in that process, you can see it in other people, what was in me. And it was starting to just like, oh my gosh. And then one day I decided, well, since I'm not really good at coaching, that's what I thought it was. Let me become a digital marketer. Because by the time I'd gone through the four coaching certifications and rebranded myself four times, I've got the business cards to prove it, I was really good at the tech side of business, understanding domains and understanding how to hook things up. And I could match colors and fonts really well, and I could build sites. And then all of a sudden, somebody said something about being an affiliate for a company. And I'm like, an affiliate? Monthly recurring revenue? I'm in $5,000 a month and I could get them to pay for a car? That was my big dream. So I get started and I realize again, I come up against the client game. I was so smart. I was so good at what I did until again, I was at the wall. And I actually removed myself from my home in Vancouver from my marriage, said, I need a break, and went to Mexico and said, I'm not coming back till I either have this thing figured out or I'm not coming back, meaning I was going to kill myself. It was so drastic, the psychological trauma that I had put myself through. If you could even get to a place of understanding when you start on Monday, like this is going to work, and then you hit another Friday where it doesn't, and you do that over and over and over again, and as an intelligent person, the only answer, and I'm going to use the intelligence in quote marks, the only answer I had is it must have been something wrong with me. Inherently, there was something wrong. But I went to Mexico, spent my last $500 on a gentleman who's probably, I would say, saved my life in more than one way. Do you know what he told me to do? Go and talk to people. I was like, what? No. Let me build a funnel and a website and do all of that instead. That is easier. I didn't realize how afraid I was. So I started doing that because I was desperate. I sold 10 $997 packages for ClickFunnels before I left a month later because I got on to sell it as an affiliate and realized they didn't know what they were doing and I knew how to do it. So I was like, okay, let's sell it. And from there, I just never looked back. It just went, whoomph, and now I can make money. Now I can do all of that. Now it's a matter of how much money can I make? But it was a journey. And it came from the idea that when I escaped that home at 17 years old with my baby and wanted out, I wanted to be different than the rest of the family and the rest of what I saw in that town. That was the motivator for me to say, Something in my head said, I wanted something different. I'm not better. I'm not worse. I wasn't, it wasn't any of that. It's just, I wanted to be different. I felt different inside. And now I understand from the level of trauma I had, there's also the upside because up and down, left and right, it's all works itself out. And mine was way down here for me. There's people that are a lot worse. And, and I, I, I had a dream the other side that far up as well from it. And I just couldn't let go of it. So that's what has propelled me. And as a woman born in 1966 in rural Saskatchewan, Canada, where there was no internet, the thoughts and what was available to me was very limited until we found out about the internet. 
And then I can talk mm -hmm. to anyone, anywhere about anything at any time. I'm not limited anymore. With what I was programmed mm -hmm. as a child, I no longer have that. So now it's limitless what I'm able to do as a result of what this online and being able to meet amazing women like Haley. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that story. I mean, that is quite a journey that you went through. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, you've been, you mentioned 2001 is when you really started yes. realizing your, your potential of you don't need to be selling furniture or being in corporate. You could do what you really desire to do. And so how long would you say that after you got that in 2001, it took you to figure it out basically to where you are now? Just for people to have that that timeline, because I think it's easy for us entrepreneurs to compare ourselves to someone right. far, far ahead of us. Right. So, you know, you mentioned all of this that you went through. How long in years do you think that really was? It was a lot longer than it probably needed to be based on my own thinking. But I went back to Korea in 2007 and 2008. So the first time I went was 2001. And I came back with a level of confidence I didn't have before because I knew that I could do anything because of what I accomplished in Korea and didn't understand the language. And it's such a different culture. So mm -hmm. my kids were still young. So I waited. I felt, again, that was my own guilt as a mom, but I felt that I needed to wait until they were grown before I could step into what it is I wanted to do. And that was approximately 10 years ago now, 13 years ago. It took about three years to be playing around as a coach before I really stepped into it, into the ClickFunnels side, etc. And then I was making a decent amount of money, like six figures, mid six figures. And I, then the pandemic hit. And mm -hmm. ClickFunnels mm -hmm. is the software I was involved in, and I could no longer align myself with that company. Values-wise, what they were doing, who they were, what they stood for, the bro marketing, all of the things didn't line up with what was true. So I pulled back and I went local for a while during COVID in the middle of rural, like northern Saskatchewan. And then, I, can't, I never remember the dates and the times, but two, two and a half years ago, I got a hold of it again by finding another piece of software that I felt I could not only use myself, but I could then recommend to my people because we're building our businesses, but we're really essentially building our lives on our business. The finances, we take them, that money home and we amplify that in our communities and in our families. And I needed it to be something I could rely on. So it took me about six months to investigate the next company. I actually flew into Dallas three times to sit with the owners. And I was really serious. I knew if I got a hold of it, there would be no holding me back this time. So mm -hmm. that's what's yeah. happened as a result is now I know exactly where I'm going and exactly who I am and have given myself permission to be me and to do it the way I need to do it. And that was a journey that took me, looking back, I would love to say it took me too long, but it took as long as it took. And these instant yeah, it, stories, exactly. right? These instant stories of success yeah, I think they happen, but I think they're not telling the whole story. Definitely. I mean, it takes as long as it takes. And yeah. There's no rushing success. I mean, so I really appreciate you giving us that timeline. And to go back to really how you started to grow your business a lot, you mentioned you just needed to start talking to people. Yes. And this is something that I hear all the time. People like you said, they build their website, yeah. they start their podcast, they start their Instagram, and then they're like, okay, where is everyone? Right. Like, why is no one paying attention to me? Right. But it's truly because you haven't done the most important part, which is meeting people, building those connections, starting to actually show off what you do. And so once you, once that light bulb clicked in your head of, okay, I need to actually connect with some people, did you already know who your ideal client was? No, because I was going so, in to sell software to them. They get on the mm -hmm. call with me. And this is the most valuable piece of talking to people that I learned. And that was what I was saying to you earlier. I don't know what I'm really good at. It's so second, mm -hmm. second nature to me. But they wanted me to set up their account and do their marketing for them. And I'm like, but that's the easy part. I'm just going to get you the account. Don't you know that already? <laughs> 
that kind of idea. It was taken aback a little bit in the conversations. And it's like, okay, well, I can do that for $997. That was way underpriced. And I just started pitching. <clears throat> I can do that. First one, I think I sold it at $300. Like you could capitulate usually the first couple of times. And then the mentor just said to me, just add $10 each time. And all he was trying to do was get me to add something, right? Like it was, op I was open enough to $10. If he would have said double, I might've been like, he was smarter than me, obviously. Right. When he said it, but talking to people, what happened is I didn't just reach out and the first person talked to me. I went into this group to be of service, to give first. That's what I'm really good at. I learned this from Alcoholics Anonymous. Now I'm not an alcoholic, but somebody called me one once. And my answer was, well, let's go to Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't want that, you know, and now I know alcoholics don't actually do it that way. But I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and I actually needed the life skills from there to learn how to manage life because my home adult child of alcoholics is probably where I should have been. And I learned about service when you're really caught up in yourself. When I say you, I mean me, I mean we. <clears throat> the going out and talking to somebody else actually gets me off my own problems and helps me move forward, believe it or not. So I've done it each time I've needed to move forward. I just know to go serve somebody. So I walked in their full service. Just how can I help? You, I knew how to take the background off of that lady's logos on her funnel so that they were all the same color so it didn't look shitty. And I just, here, here it is, no charge. Just go, go, go. I did it for days. I sat at this computer for probably 16 hours a day. And just with the notifications on in the ClickFunnels group, somebody said something and I'm in right away. Happy to help. Mm, okay. Wow. Let me help. And I literally helped. And then at the end of the conversation, they would say, well, how can I work with you? And I go, well, I don't know. What do you need? Like, let me help you. I didn't know what I was doing. And I think it's that beginner's luck. It was part of that, but I genuinely wanted to serve. Nobody wants to do that anymore. We think that we're worth, oh, all my worth and I'm high ticket and all of that. I'm like, that sounds great. I don't know you can do what you say you can do. I, it, the charlatans and the, especially in the coaching world, like people say they can do things, they, they don't have a clue. I ha when I hire now, I have to give a full test before I can even consider them because they say they can do it and they can't even come close. They don't even have to log into stuff. So the service thing, you'd be amazed still today by going out and giving first, I win like, it'll take me to $10 million in five years, just from absolutely. being absolutely of service. We've got to get our own ego out of the way and go and be of service to people. I still think that's the number way, one way to do this. And it's in conversation because I need to know the problem they have. What can I do to help solve it? Because I went back out again in December and did all the research again around some next steps I wanted to take. I went and talked to 15 people, coaches and consultants, my niche, and said, what do you need? Where are you at? What's going on? And I swore they wanted coaching from me. That's where I would have went. They, nope, we want the tech. I'm like, damn. Okay, I'll do the tech. Because I get the same result for them which is monthly recurring revenue so I can save their business for them and their family and for their clients. We still get the same result. The thing that I wake up for every morning is great things happen when women have money. I still get to do that. Mm -hmm. It just looks like tech. They see me as that person. Well, I'm not going to argue with you all the way to the bank. So you don't know unless you go talk to people what they want from you. And if you think business is yeah. all about passion and all of that, good luck with you. I wish you the best. But I you actually do have to take a lot of action. A yeah, lot of action that absolutely. isn't passionate. <laughs> <Ready? laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> I used to offer free consulting sessions. They were like 30 minutes long. And I really evaluated people's podcasts from marketing to content to everything. And I did those for free. Yeah. And I was doing like two a day for all these different industries. And after a while, I was like, okay, like, I need to start charging for this. But if I didn't do those free sessions for months, probably like four or five months, yeah. I would have not learned what I know now and that I can now charge for exactly like you're saying. There's a lot of people who maybe take a course and they're like, okay, I'm certified. Let me do this. But they haven't actually no. taken action on, on the process. It's really challenging when I see someone wanting to help me build my business when they can't build their own. And mm. I can help you with your funnel and not have a funnel, but I can build a business and I can show you how to build a business. It's different. So that's that imposter syndrome that we talk about, right? Like 
I don't need to be great at my social media to show you how to do yours, but I got a thriving business yeah. because I have a different type of business. I'm a solopreneur on my own. I don't need social media. I need to talk to people, right? But I can help you with your social media, but I built a business. And if I haven't built a business yet, then I better go out and start building a business. And it, it, not a lot of people want to do that today. We don't want to put the skin in the game. We're not really committed to it. We want that instant gratification or we want to know that it's going to work right out, right out of the gate or we think it's failed and we quit. Well, that's actually also not how business is built. Business is built by making the commitment that you're going to make it work and you go out and fail 16 times and you keep getting back up. You're not going to get the, all the lovely fluffy stuff at the beginning. I had a guy in New Jersey, and I'm so grateful there was a border between us and a couple of states. That guy freaked me out so bad, I still remember him. Like, I swear he was a serial killer. Like, there was something really oh wrong gosh. with him. Like, really, really, uh -huh. like, scraped my soul. Like, oh, I couldn't get off the call bad enough. Like, all that gaslighting and all that stuff that they talk about. I didn't know those words back then, but I just knew I got to get off the call. And I was so scared to end the call. Like, he's going to come after me. Like, it was horrendous. And I'm so glad that I went through that. But most people, when that happens, they quit because no one told them that's normal, that you're going to get that. And then you're going to get the one that's going to charge back. And then you're going to get the one that's going to threaten you. And then you're going to get the one that makes fun of your hair. No one talks about that, right? I used to do the 52 cards game mm -hmm. and shuffle them up. And it's just like that in business for every 50, and I, I put 54 cards. The jokers are in there because there's two for every 54 cards you draw, there are two jokers. And there are also four aces. Those are the clients. You just have to keep drawing. And then you're going to get the kings and the queens and the jacks that tell you they're going to be clients. And those are the most dangerous because they will, you'll actually stop and go, oh yeah, they said there'd be a client. So we stop flipping cards, meaning we stop talking to people. But if you do 54 cards, you're going to get four clients. It's almost inevitable. The math just works itself out. And I learned that in sales. I, oh, I really like that. It's that, you know, thought process of yeah. I just have to get through these to actually find the right clients. I mean, I have so many horror stories of right connection calls. I've done that. Like, just I was thinking about one the other day. I told this guy my price and his face was like, and I was like, okay, that was actually dramatic but thank right, you for that does. now it I know what to do I so yeah. true so powerful so courageous of you to do that but we think it's a sign to stop when it's actually a sign to keep moving forward I wish the movies would show us when like Wonder Woman and I don't know any other female superheroes when they go to save the world it looks like it's like they put stars and you know all the lovely music and everything around her nobody's saying that she's about to shit her pants because it's so scary. We think courage yeah. feels good. It doesn't feel good. It feels like you're going to die. That moment before you make that call, that moment. But we, because nobody tells us that, when we feel that way, we think we're on the wrong path, that this is supposed to feel amazing and it's supposed to go well. No, it's supposed to feel like crap. Yeah. Yeah, just like that sign behind you, live in possibility. I mean, there's a possibility it'll be amazing. There's a possibility the person on the phone will be a creeper. Like, there are so many possibilities. Everything in but life. But you really hope that it's going to be the best. You do, but you don't know until you flip the card, right? And here's what I also want to really tell people about business. When you set out and you get the goal and it's really exciting at the beginning and you just finished coaching school or you just finished your thing and you think this is lovely and I'm like, oh, oh, oh that's that newbie syndrome. We know you're going to get hit. You're going to hit a wall because no one told you that this thing is 50-50. You're going to feel good 50% of the time. You're going to feel shitty 50% of the time. And we just think the 50 that we feel shitty is not supposed to happen because aren't we on the happiness project or aren't we on all of these things? Life it doesn't work that way. It's 50-50. You don't want to be happy at a funeral. Life isn't that way. It doesn't work that way. So it's always 50-50. If you can't see it, you're just focused on the bad. Or the Pollyannas are just focused on the good. They don't see the other stuff that's happening. It is in, it's, it's science. I got kicked out of science, but I'm smart enough to know that it, with every good is a bad, with every up and is a down, with every left is a right. It's not possible to not have it. Just it's against the way the world works. So if we are focused on the three people that said no, 
we're missing all the good stuff. So then we don't have the energy to move into the next piece because we're not telling ourselves the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And I really appreciate you sharing this part of entrepreneurship because it's the part that's not really talked about it's very not, much. It's not. We enough. always hear about the highlight reels, we, the wins, we the amazing things. We don't want mindset. Things. We don't want mindset. I was on with a coach the other day and she said, yeah, no, we don't want mindset. She wants me to speak at an event in Vancouver. And I'm like, okay, so what do you want me to talk to them about? The three goals they had this week that they didn't make because they got confused or their daughter needed them or they didn't feel like it. What do you want me to give them? Another tactic? Do you want me to give them the three tips to overcome procrastination? That's not the problem. The problem was the thought process that stopped them. We have a default track the way we think. We just don't know always what it is. You go and set yourself some really big goals and start a business and you're going to find out really quick what you think of yourself, what you think of the world, and what you think of money. That's the issue. But no, we think it's, oh, Oh, I, yeah, ah, it's self-sabotage. Oh, it's just procrastination. And you know, you and I and a bestie can get together and talk about procrastination like it's the third world problem. And it's really just a thinking process. It's just mm -hmm. fear wearing really pretty shoes. That's it. But we make it all this and that, you know, all that. And it's, it's nothing but I thought that this wasn't going to work. So then I felt devastated. So then I didn't take the action I wanted to take and I got the result of it isn't going to work. I, I'm fulfilling on my own goddamn prophecy. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a powerful being. But what if I take that and go, well, what if this does work? Then what actions do I take, right? Based on how that would make me feel a lot more empowered. And then I'm going to take different actions and imagine that the results are different. What? This isn't about my mother. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know absolutely. what I'm saying? Or absolutely. the client or the dollars down or the economy's bad. Like, I don't know how, how much more do you and I as women want to accept from ourselves and from other women, the abdication of the power that we have to some unknown source you can call it God, you can call it taxes, you can call it men, you can call it your education, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But I'm here to say that it is no longer acceptable for us to no longer tell ourselves that we are not powerful because we have the power to create the shit. So let's create the good. And that's what I'm always here to say is I'm not going to look at you and mamby pamby you and insult your intelligence by saying you can't do this. You're right. It's just not, not on my watch. But it looks mm -hmm. like tech. Yeah. Remember, it just looks like tech. I help people build SaaS companies. What? Same shit, different day. Doesn't matter what mm -hmm. we're building. Yeah. I mean, as a business owner, I mean, you are your whole business. You have all of these different skill sets. And yes. even if we think of like, I don't know, Target, for an example, like they do sell clothes, they sell beauty products, they sell groceries, like they sell everything. And so as our own businesses, of course, we have a little bit of everything in us, we have to yeah. be doing the accounting, the business work, our own mindset work. I yeah. mean, we can't really ignore any part of it. So I really do like how even though it looks like tech for you, it is so many other things that embody your business because yes. we're all like multifaceted people. I mean, if we were just talking about one thing all day long, if I only talked about podcasting, how to press record or something like right. that, no one would listen to me. Yeah. We need different things to make us our own special businesses. We've got such a beautiful gathering of skills that we've acquired as we've walked through this life, especially women. We have done things that we never thought we could do. Like, like things that we can't even imagine we would have been through, right? By the time you hit 40, like if you, if you've kept someone alive, you know what I mean? Like a dog, I'd raised any, that level of commitment, right? It's not like you have a child and you don't think you're going to get through it all the way to the end. You don't give up when the teenager years hit, eh? but we'll do that with our business. So it's really, really important to take all of us and bring it into the business and use the pieces at different times as, as they're needed. And it's so interesting to see. Somebody said to me the other day, 
I grew up on a farm, <laughs> right? And somebody said, like, tell me what growing up on a farm, how did that help you in your business? And I was like, well, that's an interesting question. And the thought that came to imme me immediately was like in the middle of the night when it's really cold like it is in the Northern Hemisphere right now, we had to go knock, because it was a while ago, right? I'm a little bit older. We had to go knock the ice off of everything so that the cattle could drink or we'd have dead cattle, right? There was no procrastinating about that. There was no, it's after business hours, things had to get done. And I think that mindset of the direct correlation between what I did, my actions and what the results were was very powerful for me. We ate, we sold that the cattle or whatever to like, it was different than going to an accounting job, right? Kind of idea. Same thing. You still exchanged, but there was that work ethic that I had that I think really helped me. That was in 1984, for God's sakes, right? Like, so imagine what skills you have. If you would sit and ask yourself, what certifications have you had? What have you completed? When we really go and take a good look at it, because we're really good at the, who do you think you are? Right? Kind of, my mom used to say that. Who do you think you are? The queen of Sheba. I'm like, well, maybe. Like later I looked her up and yeah, I thought, maybe. oh, she's a cool bitch. I think I could be her in another life. But I was like, interesting, isn't it? I do have a skill set in here and I did do that. And that's right. I did that. But we don't tell ourselves that. We think that if I just beat myself up a little bit more, I'll get better at things. But it's actually the opposite. I need to sit on and stand on everything I've done in the past. That gives me the confidence. From there, I can get the courage to go get the next thing that I need to do. Then I get more confidence. I don't get confidence out front. I get confidence from what yeah. I did in the past, what I've been able to accomplish. And we just shrug it off. Like I said in the beginning, I just shrugged it all off. And not very, I'm not really good at anything. That's a lie. That was a lie. Yeah. Just a bold faced lie. But Absolutely. So how do we find our genius? Like, I know you've went through all of this work to find yours and realize it's multiple things. But for anyone just starting, how do we do that? There's a guide that I created a long time ago, and it's called What's Your Genius? And I'll give you a PDF for it. You can put it out for people. And if I remember correctly, I started with what are my values? I needed first to understand who I really truly was, not who I thought I should be. Not who my society tells me I should be. As a woman, as a person that came from Saskatchewan, Canada, there's an identity as a Canadian. Am I supposed to be that now? I don't know. I live in Mexico. Does it work for me still? I don't know, right? I should be this and I should be that. Churches are really infamous for that as well. I should be a certain way as a woman, right? But do those fit today? That's the question. So we're always growing and changing. And I needed to understand first who I was again at this time in my life. So I started to really evaluate that and look at what are my values. Then I went looking for strengths. And then I went to people that knew me and asked them, what do you like about me? What do you think I'm really good at? And I started the self-exploration. Then I started to dream again. When you're in a job, it's really hard to step out and have a company when all your friends are still in the job, especially if a lot of them, like me, when I worked for Bell Canada, we would all go out to dinner, 30 people and all the blackberries would be on the table. Like there's a community there. And then I step out and want to be a business owner. I'm going to stand alone. That's pretty frightening, right? Like the community leaves mm -hmm. us. And sometimes there's that part of it as well. But the dream for me was... I didn't want to get to the end of my life and say to myself, I could have, if I wasn't so scared, mm -hmm. I could have fulfilled on the things I said I wanted. And they are to be wealthy. They are to live by the beach in Mexico, which I've fulfilled on. We're here. And those things that a lot of people I found out later really afraid to do. I thought they were easy, but they're, they're harder. But I wanted a house by the water. I wanted all of these things, I like pretty things and, and those things take money. And I had to really work on my money mindset. I had to work on all of that in allowing myself, but I'm going to take care of my family. But I'm, I'm like, oh no, I'm going to make $10 million for me because mm -hmm. I'm going to show you it's possible. This, 
if you can see me make $10 million, could you make 100,000? But there's not enough female role models. Like I went to use an yeah. example as somebody, all I could come up with was Wonder Woman. Like, where are they? They're all male. So it's challenging mm -hmm. for me if I already don't believe, and I don't see any examples of it. So my commitment is to be that example for myself and my family yeah. and for myself and for the women that I work with. And I help facilitate yeah. that by the tech and the tools and the things that I know how to do. But it really is in, I'm going to ask you when building a business, because that's what I do is I help women build businesses. I'm going to ask you to push past that. It's a little hypocritical of me if I don't do it myself, but I know what it looks like and smells like and tastes like. That's what you got as well, Haley. When you went and did all those interviews, you knew what it looked like and smelled like and tastes like. When you're talking to business owners, there's a level of empathy that happens. And there's a level of knowing when you're belly to belly with another business owner that's so empowering that they will pick up on if you're talking to a true business owner. That's 90% of your problem on sales calls. Yeah. 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 You actually need to know what they're dealing with to be able to help them. And I love that. And I'll definitely put that PDF in the show notes. So thank you for explaining that to us. And I totally understand what you mean. Like there needs to be more women who are just like you speaking about how other women can make money. And there's far too many women who are feeling held back because maybe they don't have a community. Yes of women pushing them up. I mean, it's one thing to have your friends be like, oh yeah, you got this. But it's another thing to have someone who is where you are or where you want to be yeah. pulling you up with them, you know, like empowering all of that. That's all very important. And I'm sure as you spoke with more people, like we talked about earlier, you were able to understand that is what the world needs. That's what maybe the women you were talking to needed. I mean, something had to have happened for you to be like, this is it. This is where I want to bring people up with me. So have you ever watched an episode of Dateline? I have seen a few, yes. Right. How many stories in those shows and shows like it, do you see a woman who financially could not have been on her own and as a result is not safe and secure in her own environment, in her own home, providing a lot of, there's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of different things that are happening. Women can't get out. At the basic fundamental level, it's a pandemic of women who are unable to get a cab home on a Friday because the choice is child's shoes. So that has to stop. That mm -hmm. is absolutely not necessary if we start a business. Even if I can make $1,000 more a month, and I can set that aside for myself because whether or not we want to admit it, money gives us choices. We say money isn't everything. I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to convince me of that. Because if it wasn't, then why are we not on the street? Your level of money is perfect. The ones that have more of you, it's not. So where's the line? Why is it that this is okay, but the person over here that's homeless, why aren't we all there? Because we have different ideas about money, right? But a woman today who has the skill set, which we all have, could put together and do something online and hustle and go and help some people and be of service. Yes, it's going to be tiring. Yes, it's going to be pushing through. Yes, it's going to be all of that. But what's the other choice? Living a life that is less than what we were here to do because it's going to take money to fulfill on who I actually am. Yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. I mean, money gives you choices. And speaking of powerful women, I'm sure we've all seen the Dave Ramsey podcast. Like, I don't love him, but he is the, he was the number one podcast in his field in money. But Tori Dunlap, the founder of her first 100K, I don't know if you've yes, heard of her, but she her. just got that number one spot. Yeah, on we the needed to knock him charts. off. We so needed to knock him off. <laughs> we did. And a woman knocked him off. Yeah. So. It's so we love that. I love seeing powerful women yes. in Me too. what seems to be like male dominated fields. Well, we have a lot of thoughts about what women should be doing with money and how much we should be allowed. You will see it online when women start talking about money. Other women will come in and start arguing for their own limitations. That's too much. What do you need all that for? So they're arguing, trying to argue for the other person, but they're actually arguing it for themselves and for every other woman they know. And I don't think we have that right. 
I don't think that you or the neighbor or anyone else has a right to tell me how much money I can or should or shouldn't make. That's up to me because I'm not taking it from you because I'm taking something that I've created in my own mind and heart and soul from my own experiences. I've created it. I didn't take anything from over here. I've created something from here, right? Learned it and take it into the world. And it's extremely valuable and people pay me for it, but it didn't take any money from Betty. Yeah. I didn't take anything from anyone. In fact, by me doing that, I'm able to empower my team and I employ women. Mm -hmm. So it's, interesting to see what we'll say about women and money. And there's an agenda Definitely. around a lot of that. If we really want to go down that road, right? You can't be controlled if you have money. Mm -hmm. So we've got to take back control. And that's what I was saying earlier. We're absolutely abdicating everything. And it comes down to that phrase, right? Prince Charming. He ain't coming. But yet we still now are, so what's happening is we thought it was Prince Charming. Now he's not coming, but we still haven't gone to, oh, it could be me. It's me. That's where we haven't gone yet. And that's the yeah. issue. I love that. I love that. So in the last couple minutes, I mean, I've loved this conversation. I would love it if you could share who you work with and how people can connect with you. Perfect. So monthly recurring revenue is absolutely necessary in a business today. It's what we call self-care for a business, especially for coaches and consultants. I feel that if I can help a coach get clients and make money, coaches will heal the world. And it's not like a doctor or dentist where clients just kind of like show up, right? You know, a coach is different. And the coaching environment right now is really challenging because of their, every man and his dog is a coach since COVID but they're unqualified and it's squishing out the, the space is getting so crowded for so many people. So monthly recurring revenue is going to help a coach with the, you know, the feast famine cycle. And it's also going to help with the burnout cycle that we get from coming out with the next offer, next offer, next offer, next offer, and that can't get off that promotion. So I help people build their own SaaS business by white labeling a product called high level, which is built for businesses to white label and sell as their own. So you can have your own ClickFunnels company, you can have your own Dubsado company, and it gives you that monthly recurring revenue stream because I pay for my software every month. I don't question, even if I haven't used it all that much, I just keep paying for it. And that's what you can do with your own business. And it helps you build a beautiful ecosystem because coaches are actually referring people to software anyway. They're building a marketing campaign, they're doing email, they're doing social media, they're building a funnel. And they're like, well, everybody's going to ask the guru, where, what do you use? Well, I used to tell them ClickFunnels and active campaign. Now I say, refer them, I refer them to my own software and they pay me monthly for it. And they pay me the monthly fee of what we're doing together. And it's a beautiful thing. And the churn rate for clients, meaning the percentage of people that don't come back is a hundred percent. We don't realize that the moment you get a client is the moment you no longer have a client. Like it's just, it's inevitable, but in the software industry, the churn rate is single digit. Meaning if I get 10 people, only one is going to leave. Mm. So I don't have a big hole in my bucket. I don't have to, what is it? Bucket water so fast that right. to keep the, the lights on, keep the thing turning, so to speak. So I help women build that and brand it and sell it and support it and get it all safe and secure and legal and all of those things. So I've helped people build multiple six and seven figure software businesses, starting from a friend of mine saying, do you think you could do the tech? And I learned from Korea, yes. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew I could do it. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm sure you have tons of more resources on, Thousands. you know, I would love to get more into that, but that is amazing. So how can people connect with you if they have any questions on how they can get started with you or just learn more about white labeling? It's a really interesting concept. And I would love to get on a call with anyone that would like to know more. And you can find me at your GHL or go high level ghlgal.com. Or my name, PamelaJoanDale.com. You can also get there. 
you can find me on social at your GHL gal as well. And there are a lot of resources that I've put together. Again, give everything away for free. And I've got a full SaaS suite that will get everything set up. So Awesome. I will put all of those in the show notes. I loved the, our conversation today. I mean, we talked about how you got to where you are. We talked about empowering women. We talked about finding your genius. There's a lot of things. But to wrap this all up, I would love you to challenge the audience with three things that they can do this week to move forward past this conversation. Any three steps to kind of tie this all together that they could take this week. So I think the first thing I had to do was really tell myself the truth that I wanted more, wanted more than what I had, wanted more than what was in, available to me at that moment. And it was really scary to talk about it in public. So I always say, start with a private revolution first, get it in your own heart, mind, and soul. And we won't even go there if we don't think that, oh, I can't be like Pamela. I can't be like Haley. So I just don't like what you're doing. That's what we'll do a lot of times, right? Versus just telling ourselves the truth. Okay, what if it was possible? You're going to be okay. If it doesn't come to pass, we've had lots of hopes and dreams that we've let go of. That's okay, but at least give this one a run. So in your own heart and mind and soul, tell the truth. And then tomorrow, if you want to cover it up again and watch Netflix, go for it. Just know that that's what first has to happen. And second would be reach out to someone. We all know someone who loves us more than we love ourselves. And that could really give us that hug or that little pep talk. And if you don't, walk into a chamber of commerce or walk into a meeting and there'll be a coach there. There'll be somebody there. And if you genuinely have that desire, it's so interesting to watch the universe just rise up. And we'll call it coincidences, right? Oh, you'll never believe what happened to me today, right? But it's when the heart opens, I think, and it's, and somebody will appear. And then what if this was possible? What would you do? Ask that question next. Well, if this was possible, what would I do next? And ask yourself, start asking yourself those questions versus going out to the next guru that's going to tell you it's Instagram or the next one's going to tell you it's not Instagram. You're going to pay for their course. And you're going to get three months down the road. $297 later and no further ahead, start to trust yourself. And just like, I ask my future self, what would she do today? How can I befriend her? How can I 10 years from now look back and go, I was my own friend. And sometimes that's the most powerful thing. And I'm just learning really how to do that a lot more now than I ever have, because I would flip into confusion because I was afraid. But now it's tell myself the truth. What would I do if I really who could I get to help me? Because the other lie is that this is done alone. And it's not done alone. This journey isn't done alone. So we need help. Yeah. Oh, I love those. Thank you so much for sharing those. And thank you again for joining me today. What a pleasure. I really appreciate that. And everything you mentioned will be down in the show notes for any listeners. So be sure to go connect with Pamela. And thank you again, Pamela. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for allowing me the platform to share a story that I hope will in some capacity, if you could listen through some of it and see where you can see yourself. And if it's possible for me, it's possible for anyone. Thank you for listening to the Employee to Boss podcast. If you made it to the end of this episode, I hope that you implement the actionable steps from this week's experts so you can get started with your business today. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the Employee to Boss podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Remember, a little progress each day leads to big results. We come out with a new episode every Tuesday. To access our show notes, transcripts, and courses, please check out EspressoPodcastProduction.com.